Hi, this is Russ McGlynn giving this uh, lesson from sunny California, where everybody, including a lot of businesses, are leaving and moving to Texas. I plan to stay here, but uh, it's pretty rough here some days with the politics. But anyway, we're here to see God's handiwork in his creation. And I've been teaching now for almost 32 years, homeschool and creation science, and been a home missionary with Twin Cities Creation Science Association for almost 30 of those years. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Vikings and evidence for them being here in the new world many, many years before Columbus. First, I'm gonna give an update on our mission here that is supported through donations to Twin Cities Creation Science Association. This is uh, my diorama of Jerusalem, built it many years ago, but uh, shows the Tower of David and the Golden Gate here that Christ will return through when he comes back to take over the world. In April, we had a open house and Saturday and Sunday, we had a total of 70 people, including children. So that was a great blessing. We're planning one now for October, last week before Halloween. And it's called Giants in the Earth. And we'll be looking at a lot of giant animals, as well as Goliath at nine feet. And I'll be showing a model I built of him, a 3D model. I made a new exhibit with a diorama of Golgotha, the tomb and the garden where Mary meets Jesus for the Easter week program that we put on. John and Peter run to the tomb, the garden where Mary meets Jesus. And I also had a program called How We Got the Bible, starting with Adam up until the Gutenberg Press which you see up there in that model. After that, Bibles became very inexpensive and literally flooded the world. Before that time, even English Bibles were handwritten and so very expensive to buy. Churches had them, but the everyday person did not. So October, we're gonna have an open house with giant animals. Here's my model of the mammoth, nine feet tall at the top of its head, or 10 feet, I should say. I had it together about uh, four or five months ago to show the kids. This is my friend, John Sturkin, who often assists me. We will include Goliath at nine feet. Also, another giant dinosaur. This will be the Apatosaurus back vertebra. That's a nine foot tall puzzle seen here. This is the drawing that I copied it off of an Apatosaurus called Tacanosaur found in Argentina. I'm also working on giant structures such as the Chinese wall of which I'm building a model. This is the Mongol side. They built the Great Wall over 9,000 miles long to uh, keep the Mongols from invading. This is the ballista for shooting spears and a, well, trubuchet is the big one. This is the smaller one, which is just uh, rock uh, throws stones. And this is the guard station where the guards um, live when they're on duty. Down underneath are the rooms where we have the, we have two horses ready to run in either direction. These, these two doors connect to the wall on the outside, which I will build eventually a small section. Uh, these are the dorms for the soldiers, storage area here, sergeant and uh, assistant here and 
possibly a major who would be in charge of eight or 10 of these towers on the Great Wall. They had towers like this about every three to five miles. Here's the China side. There's windows for ventilation in the back side of the guards station. And I'm giving away free for any donation towards our mission, a fictional historical romance novel I have written called The Wall. It takes place during the Ming Dynasty at about 1450 AD. And you can order it through my email at russmaglen uh, at juno.com. We will use it also to minister at a camp near Spokane, spelled that wrong too, I thought I corrected all this, Spokane, Washington. China and Taiwan are closed at this time, and may be for quite a while. We hope to go to a, this Christian camp started by some missionary friends who left China two years ago. Uh, they left Southern China. They've asked us to come and speak to their Chinese college students there. Also free for any donation towards our mission is the book I've written called Song of Solomon, God's Love Manual. Uh, also, there's going to be at the end of this month, a catalog of books at my website. I'll give you that in a minute. A, newer, a new one we're putting together, my daughter-in-law is putting together for me. And it, it's also gonna be linked to the one at Twin Cities Creation Science Association. This is one of the most important books I've written based on my relationship to Tricia who passed away five years ago, but we were together for 49 years. And I learned so much together with her about uh, being a husband and father. And thank the Lord, I've been able to do that with my new wife, Amy. And the things I learned through Tricia have helped me to be a better husband to her. Here's the catalog that will be there at our website by the end of the month. And you can pause this video if you wanna look at it also. I'm sorry, this uh, email I'm moving to Central Coast, uh, Central, sorry, Central Coast Dinosaur, Central Coast Dinosaurs.com. There it is. <laughs> Got it written out. So you can download that and uh, write to me if you're interested in any of these books. Some of you know Amy had cancer, finished her chemotherapy last October. She's still re recovering from that. Uh, we got COVID three weeks ago and we still are not sure how I picked it up. Uh, my daughter Heather had come down and we went to a couple of restaurants uh, just before this and I must have gotten it there. She had had it a year ago and also the shots so I, don't, I didn't get it from her. This is our picture in 2019 when we did a week's creation science program at the Chinese church in Silicon Valley, Fremont, California. As I say, the doors at this time are closed to Asia. The money that had been donated to our original mission to China, we're going to use uh, here in the United States, especially uh, with Chinese people and possibly to that camp next summer that's up in Washington near Spokane. This is the outline of the things we're gonna study about the Viking missionaries to the new world. This is the bibliography and you can uh, pause this video when you get it and get more information from these books. Our goal, my goal is to show that ancient people were technologically sophisticated, to show that God has been sending missionaries to the new world for thousands of years before Columbus to show that a Viking mission reached Minnesota about a thousand years ago to bring God's word here and to show that the Kensington rune stone is evidence of this. And finally, to show God's love towards the Amer uh, Native Americans. This is the Viking longship at Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, it's a replica that was actually sailed to Norway and then brought back here on a boat. Uh, ship. This is a view of the bow 
looking towards the stern on the port side. Uh, some of you may have been to the, the uh, Heritage Museum there at Moorhead, Minnesota. The starboard in view of the length of the boat, the starboard rudder on the starboard side of the ship. This board was used to help steer the ship by watching the stars. Thus, it was called the star board. Today, that side of the ship is called the starboard side or right side when facing the bow or front of the boat. The left side is the port side because when you docked in the port, you always had the starboard facing away from the dock so it wouldn't be crushed. Here you can see the rudder and the stern assembly. Here's the rudder connected by heavy ropes to the hull. The rudder is connected at the gunnel with ropes. The sails above the starboard. The stern of the ship. The dragon bow and sails. And some of us think they're portraying a dinosaur. This is a Scandinavian stay church reproduction at Rapid City, South Dakota. And it has dragons up here at the top, if you get a close up picture of it. Where the mast is placed in the keel strong back, this part of the ship was called the strong back. You see a close up there. And here it is again. The mast is stepped into the steel keel strong back. The shield is shown here above the holes below the third wooden plank. The shield is handy to grab if they're attacked and also protects them if they're actually rowing. The trough to carry the water from the bilge. They had a pump that would pump it up and spew it over the side. Here's the part called a trestle. You'll see that in a minute. Here's where it's fixed at the base. And also you can see a little bit in here where the bunks are and where they stored their food when they took the ship across to Scandinavia. This is the inside showing the planking held together by iron rivets. You can see those rivets there. These are examples of rivets at the exhibit at the Minnesota Science Museum many years ago. Again, this just, just shows some of the construction and a close up of them. Here's the steel strong back here that would hold the mast. This is the stern view of the ship. The bilge trough is on the far right over here. The tent shelter and at the top is called the top of the trestle. This was to hold the mast and the oars when they were in port or if they took the mast down, they could lay it across the top there also. View of the bow and the dragon's head and evidently one of the horns has been broken off. Here's the trestle again, and then the oar holes, you can see them below the shields. Underneath shows the planking and keel. This is called a lap strip, where the boards overlap each other starting at the keel. My father had a marina back in the 60s, Anacortes, Washington, and I often had to paint the bottoms of boats like this, scrape it, scrape the barnacles off, uh, laying on my back with them falling in my face if I wasn't careful. Uh, great job. Then you painted it with one gallon of copper bottom paint that cost then $25. I see it here, it's up to about $50 a gallon now. View of the main deck area, cross beams attached to the side planks. And there is the hole for the oar. Here's the dragon head close up. The mast is four stories high. And this shows a high degree of technical ability for the Vikings. 
settlements. For years, traditional archeologists said Vikings could never get to North America because, because they had no compass, they had flat bottom boats that could not tack against the wind, and the ships were too small for deep sea travel. No compass. The last navigator lesson 14 shows that the sea, South Sea Islands, Islanders could navigate all over the Pacific using only star risings and settings on the horizon. They had no compass. Uh, the book is called The Last Navigator that I used for this. They navigated for over a thousand or 1500 miles through the Pacific with a outrigger canoe that was close to 100 feet long, I believe, while a modern ship sail, sailboat followed them. And the navigator was able to bring them to an island almost 1,000 miles from where they started out with no compass. Secondly, when they said flat bottom boats could not tack against the wind, no one told them they couldn't tack, so they did anyway. Then the ships were too small, they said, for deep sea travel. Archaeologists dug up one a few years ago that was buried as a funeral ship, and it was over 100 feet long. Santa Maria, Columbus's boat, was only 60 feet. Traditional archaeologists finally accepted that Vikings got to Newfoundland, or Vinland, as they called it. Uh, there they found Viking homes and artifacts. This is a reproduction of a Viking cross found in Newfoundland and dates to 900 AD. This is a replica made by my cousin, Dick Laval. Newfoundland is on the East Coast over here. Note Lake Agassiz, which we will see later over here which at one time was connected to the Hudson Bay by the Nelson River. Other evidence shows they reached Minnesota. This is called Minnesota Woman. Two artifacts and a dagger of elk horn and a conch shell were discovered with the bones of a young woman buried in a gravel pit. And they dated at 10,000 years ago. I don't accept that. It was found by a road crew in 1931 after Lake Agassiz had dried up. Fossils of prehistoric animal, animals have been found in Minnesota, and some of them came, can be seen at St. Paul Science Museum. A number of bones of men and women have also been found, but it's not known exactly where they live. The bones of a girl were found in what once was the bottom of the glacial lake. This girl was called Minnesota Woman. And if she's as old as the clay bed of the lake bottom, which was found, she could be, have lived in Minnesota 10,000 years ago. Again, I don't accept that date. I believe she might have been one of the women that came with the Vikings. Minnesota Woman is at the Minnesota Historical Society uh, called Minnesota Mini. Uh, when I lived there, I asked if I could go down and see the bones and, uh, and see for myself. They said, well, do you have a degree in archaeology? I said, no, well, you can't go down there unless you have a degree. So I took care of that research. This may be a burial of a Viking woman. She was found with a conch shell that could only come from the ocean. It is something the Vikings might have brought from the Atlantic Ocean or acquired through trade. And they said dating was inconclusive of these bones. So how they get this 10,000 years is just based on their presuppositions. The CARM-14 dating didn't work because as I've taught before, CARM-14 is leashed out by water. If she was buried in Lake Agassiz for uh, two or 3,000 years, it probably leached out most of the CARM-14 and you can't get a CARM-14 dating then. Here I'm teaching about the Minnesota woman when we did a one day, uh, five day safari across Minnesota many years ago. First, how did the Vikings get to Minnesota? 
from Newfoundland to Hudson Bay, and then to Lake Agassiz, they would they could bring their boats that far. The lakes were left from Noah's flood and have since evaporated. We put Noah's flood that rounded off profit about 4,000 years ago, 2300 BC. The Vikings came in from the Hudson Bay and down here to Lake Minnesota, which I'll show you in a minute. How did they cross land from lake to lake? Well, they probably had this model also. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. They used to sail their boats from the Balkan lakes up into Russia. When they ran into narrow parts of the river, they would just lay down logs, as you see here, and roll the ship across. They didn't let anything stop them. Mooring stones are our main key to understanding why or how the what, what the evidence is for the Vikings being in Minnesota. Mooring stones are key to the mystery. The mooring stones holes are different from the ones that had been drilled in rocks that were used for blasting, for putting uh, powder in there and then uh, blowing it up to break up the rocks and get it out of their fields. The triangular mooring, mooring hole, you can see here, and if we go back to this one, you can also see here, it's kind of triangular shape. 300 have been identified in the Minnesota area. The star chisel used today to cut holes in rocks. I used to use this when I did cement work. It's called a star point. Mooring stones at Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, 2003. Trisha and I visited there looking for more Viking evidence. Four inch deep and triangular. I asked a rock mason uh, how long it might take to cut a hole like that using the star bit. And he said 10 to 20 minutes. This shows how the ship was probably moored. An iron pin was in the hole. If attacked, they could flip, sorry. If attacked, they could flip the stern loose and pull the anchor up and leave. They didn't have to go back on the land. Uh, they would leave their iron pin there, but they would not cut the rope as we see in many movies where they take an ax and cut the rope because uh, the nearest Marina supply place was back in Scandinavia, 3,000 miles away. Showing a stake in the mooring stone there in Lake Winnipeg. Mooring holes are found lower over the years as the lake evaporated. Orville Frederich had predicted that his theory was true, that in order to prove his theory true, true, which, and he wrote the books that I used for this talk, he said, finding, he went out and tested his theory, and as he walked around the dried up Agassiz lake bed, he would find mooring stones at different elevations. As the lake dried up, the mooring stones would be further down, as you can see from the arrows there. Now the rune stone, what other, what other evidence is there for Vikings in the Midwest? This is an artist's view of the Vikings carving the Kensington rune stone near Alexandria, Minnesota. Some of you may have been to the museum there. It's a great place to visit to see these evidences and the Rune stone. The Kensington Rune Stone, found by Olaf Oman in 1898. Olaf Oman was pulling a tree out of the ground to clear his land for crops. 
when he and his helpers found the stone gripped by the tree roots. How and where it was found, this is what I call in-depth information, and I'm not going to read this whole thing. Again, you can stop the videotape and read it yourself. Now, the message on the front, it says eight Goths and 22 Norwegians on exploration journey from Vinland of the West. We had camped beside two islands, one day's journey north of this stone. We were out fishing one day. After we came home, found 10 men red, referring to them with blood and dead and dead. Ava, Ave Maria. Deliver from evil, deliver us from evil. That's the front part. Where has it been since then? Uh, this again tracks where it's been over the years and reference here. The Vikings buried the dead and may have fled west to friends, the Mandan Indians. One theory is that they were attacked by angry Vikings who did not want to come under Norway's control and did not want to accept the gospel. The king of Norway who had sent these men, uh, we'll see him at the end here, had sent them for one reason to go and find the Viking settlements and bring the gospel of Christ to them. The Vikings may have intermarried with the friendly Mandan Indians. Similarities to the Mandans and Vikings. When missionaries, white missionaries got to the Mandans, they already knew about Adam and Eve. They knew about the devil and they knew about Noah's flood. They said their ancestors came in a huge boat to that area. They could know this from the children of Noah, passing it on. Then they also knew about the virgin mother, the miracle working child, an early church tradition, not in the Bible, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And they could only know this from people who knew the New Testament. The Mandans have had red and blonde hair have had young people born, or babies born with red and blonde hair with blue eyes. And we think that that's because they intermarried with the Vikings. Now the message on the side here says, have 10 men by the sea to look after our ships. 14 days journey from this island, year 1362. The ones Staying by the sea would be up at Hudson Bay, waiting for them to come back. The men may have been Vikings waiting for them at north at the Hudson Bay. Now the altar stone, more data or discoveries that show Vikings presence. Here I'm pointing to the area where Viking mooring stones were found near Alexandria. Now this area in front of me at one time was called Lake Minnesota, as you saw on the map previously. Now the water's all gone, but if you, we walked over there where I'm pointing and there were mooring stones there at the, where the beach would have been of the original lake. Viking altar stone, here the holes were cut to hold two rods. Uh, sorry, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, for the sacrament table, these Vikings were Catholic and they would put, this is an artist's drawing of the altar at Sock Lake, north of Sock Center. Viking altar stone table placement, you can see it there. And then they would have a tarp possibly stretched across the top. These are altar sacrament or communion tables found in the area. And down here, you can see a hole here and they thought that they would store things in there with a cork. 
This shows how the wooden rods would hold the sacrament stone in place. I had only twigs available for the demonstration. This shows where another rod may have been held, helped hold the canvas roof across the top. This is a close up of the canvas anchor hole. Here I am pointing to where the boats were moored. Here I explain where the Viking boats may have been moored. Close up of the mooring area, the lake came up this high a thousand years ago. There's the altar stone or the backside of the altar stone here. And there you can see it in a distance. The, an L-shaped set of rocks here below the altar stone indicate that when the lake was higher, the Vikings could sail up the creek below the altar rock and dock their ship. Now, local people have found many Viking artifacts over the years. This is Alice Kaiser holding a Viking halberd and Arlene Friedrich, Orwell's wife holding the Celtic twivel found by Miss Kaiser's father on his farm near Wells, Minnesota. These are other Viking artifacts that show evidence for Vikings in the area. This is a battle ax from Norway, Lake Minnesota. These are fire steel at Climax, Minnesota. Example of axes from exhibit at Minnesota Science Museum. More example, examples of Halbert's Viking axes found in the area. Swords, spears, and fire strikers found in the area. Example of household goods. This is at the Science Museum many years ago in Minnesota. Example of tongs, Viking spear. The kids could dress up as Viking children there. Viking axe, sword, hammer, adze. In the middle are garment pins and clasps. This is a model of a Viking ax that I have in my collection. Let me back up here and just say that one of the theories is that these people coming from Scandinavia, Norway, and other Scandinavian countries brought these artifacts in the 1800s to the Minnesota places there that I named. And they use them to cultivate the soil and cut trees and things. And then they dropped them in the fields and that's why they found them, uh, why we find them today, that they weren't left over from the Vikings. I totally disagree with that. These people that came from Scandinavia were not rich. Well, first of all, if these axes date back four or 500 years, why, first of all, would they bring them? They're a collector's item and expensive. And secondly, if they did bring them, why would they lose them in the field? Why wouldn't they, if they lost it, they'd go back and find it. They wouldn't just leave it there and then it'd be buried under six, 10 inches of dirt. So I reject that theory entirely. All right, here's our timeline. We have the early history of the Vikings. Starting at 800 AD, pagan Vikings raid Northern Europe for goods. At 1000, Catholic influence is stronger in the Viking areas. Leif Erikson converts to Christianity at age 15. He is commissioned by the King of Norway to travel with a priest to proclaim the gospel. 1354, King Magnus Erikson, King of Norway and Sweden, commands Paul Knudsen to take a holy mission to travel to Greenland or Vinland to bring the gospel to the Viking colonies there. 1362, we have the massacre at Kensington and the carving of the rune stone. 
1898, the Kensington runestone is found by Olaf Ullman. Then in 1909, Dr. Holland translates the writing on the stone. In 1948, the stone is placed in the Alexandria Runestone Museum in Minnesota. Now here's an infrared photograph of an area 22 miles south of Pierre, South Dakota, along the Missouri River. Now this is an airplane view, but you can see here the presence of bastions, their 200 foot spacing, and other evidence indicates that the fortifications may have been built by Norse settlers about 1362 AD. An Indian settlement is superimposed over the fortifications. That's these round areas here where the Indians lived at one time. So this dates back long before Columbus and is built similar to Norse fortifications. Testimony of the stone founder's son. Orville Fredericks, who was a Lutheran minister and author of the book used in this report, interviewed Arthur Holman a few weeks before he died in a rest home. Arthur was the son of Olaf Holman, Holman who found the Kensington runestone. His family had been ridiculed for years and accused of perpetrating a hoax. He said this, the rune stone is real. I saw it as it was dug out. My father, brothers, and I did nothing to it. The mooring stones were all there before we came. Fredericks, having learned over the years as a minister to discern when people were lying, believed this man's testimony was a true report. By the way, the, this family never made one penny off the rune stone. They never, they didn't try to sell it and they didn't have a museum where people came and looked at it, paid money. Who do you believe? A Lutheran minister who has spent his life investigating these stones. Others who consider it a hoax out of hand, but do not really look into it because they do not believe the Vikings could ever come this far west. So they don't, they won't even look at the evidence. Oral Frederick's possible explanations. This is how, what he says would be the explanation in the end of his book. One, they were never here. The story is a mean hoax. Two, they were wiped out by the bubonic plague. Three, they were killed by the Indians. Four, they were killed by the pagan Vikings. Five, they were assimilated into the Indian nation after some were killed by Vikings. As we saw there in North Dakota, with the Mandan Indians, where they have used to have children born with blue eyes and blonde or red hair. The final theory is they were marooned here when the inland sea dried up. This might go along with numbers four and five. They may have thought they would go back to Norway, but once winter came and froze the rivers and lakes, it was too late and difficult to get back to Hudson Bay. This shows God's love for the world. Matthew 28, 19 says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And they were following that principle from their kings back in Norway. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore you are of more value than many sparrows. My great grandmother on my father's side was a Jibwa Native American. And when I learned this 30 years ago, I began to study the Native Americans and look for information to show that the gospel had come here to my ancient relatives long before Columbus. And that could be a whole nother program that we could do, do for Twin Cities Creation Science Association. God wants to reach out to everyone he who does not want, he does not want anyone to perish. So he is giving them more time for everyone to repent, 2 Peter 3, 9. I do show this world trade map. And again, this is another program I could do sometime. Here we see the Vikings coming here across over to Newfoundland and then down the 
river into Minnesota with a picture here of the Viking stone or uh, with a hole in it. They found the Viking axes. Uh, these are called amphorae. They are clay pots that have been found in the Mediterranean on sunken ships, but they've also been found off the coast of Maine, Honduras, and Brazil, dating back to 2000 AD. So these are other clues that ancient people have been coming here to the New World long before Columbus, and that he indeed was last. Now I'm gonna show you just one example of ancient people who knew about North America. The Greeks have a written story or history of a trade route to America. One example, an ancient Greek writer describes the route to North America 2000 years ago. It's called, the book is called Morals and was written about 90 AD. And it was written by Plutarch and he gives directions to America 2000 years ago. He says an island called Ogig uh, Ogia, Ogig Ogigia, Ogigia, lies in ocean's arms. The Atlantic Ocean was called Ocean Sea. Distance about five days sail westward from Britain. That's about 150 miles in 24 hours. So that's five days to Iceland. Then he says the Shetland Islands, Faros and Orkney Islands are described. Before it, there are three island groups of equal distance from one another. And also from OG, uh, OG, Ogigia, bearing northwest where the sun sets in summer. He describes the never setting summer sun. In those islands, the sun is scarce hidden one hour during the day for a space of about one hour in summer. The sun doesn't set except for one hour in summer near the Arctic Circle. We know that today. There's the Arctic Circle. He describes the distance to Greenland, a continent by which the Great Sea is, is encircled is distant from this island, Iceland, about 5,000 stadia. That's about 500 miles. He describes the frozen Arctic Sea. This sea at this point of the route is difficult to be crossed by great vessels. And the opinion arose in ancient times that it was frozen. And we know that for sure, Arctic icebergs. And this is the exact area where the Titanic was hit as it came across on its very first voyage. He describes the colony, the colony's bay and its latitude. Greeks who came hither in ancient times with Hercules settled and intermarried with the native, native barbarians. The native people's language has many Greek root words according to linguistic studies. On the continent around the shores of a bay, not much smaller than uh, Maoetic, the present day sea of Azov. Over here, there's the Sea of Azov, the mouth of which lies in a direct line with the Caspian Sea. That is what blew me away when I read this. He knew that if he drew a line straight across here to this bay here, you'd, they would be connected. Finally, a word on the Tucson artifacts. So that was Plutarch at 90 AD, they knew about the North American continent. Now, this is another program I can do later at TCC SA. Now, eminent Arizona College archeologists excavated the artifacts. No one, made, made, no one made money off the artifacts. 
the Smithsonian could not accept that people had come here before Columbus, and that's why they criticized it. The man who supposedly made the pieces was never seen making lead artifacts as the ones they found. He also would have had to move tons of Kalashi to bury them. They were six feet deep. Kalashi is a type of uh, mud that's almost as hard as cement. And it, some of the artifacts were six feet deep. And if someone had dug a hole down, if they could have dug a hole down through there and then dropped these artifacts in and then reburied it, two things. One, uh, you'd have to dig with a pick in order to get down there. So it couldn't be a small hole. And number two, if they had reburied it, that would show up in any archeological digging. It would show that the soil in the, in the post hole or the hole they dug down would be different and had been moved than the original Kalashi. The hoax idea does not work. They are what they are, evidence of a pre-Columbian Roman Hebrew Christian colony. And I originally had the book from a library on loan that had to go back to them. That's a whole nother story. Some of you may have heard of the Tosarn artifacts and nobody ever made anything off of them, no money off of them. I always say a, a hoax is fast and easy, fast money and easy to you know, bury and redig. Okay, that's the end. This is the bibliography to show that Columbus was last. Settlers in the New World by Barry Fell, great uh, book showing the Phoenicians here at 2000 BC. And then uh, Plutarch's book, Hebrew Roman Christians is from the book, The Tucson Artifacts by Thomas Brent who died 1972. Uh, Vikings 1362 AD, The Great Ice Sheet and Early Vikings in America by Orville Fredericks. And finally, another book we could do a whole talk on is called The Year China Discovered the World. 1421 before Columbus, showing the Chinese sending out huge ships 450 feet long to make maps and survey the world. So there's more to this than just what I've given you today. And we're going to end now. One of the questions that we had was why do the traditional archeologists not accept this. Most of these references here are from other archeologists. There's two schools of thought, I should say. The traditional archeologists say that everything in the world migrated from the first Neanderthal in Africa, you know, 50,000 years or more ago. And so all civilization radiated out from that area and all the information, the math and all these things they have uh, came from a central point over millions of years. Well, we have the Aztec Indians in South America have a very complex language, complex writing system, and they have a very complex math system that's not they had the idea of zero as a placeholder. And it's not related to anything back in the old world. I believe that they brought that information after the Tower of Babel, having learned it from Shem, Ham, and Japheth after the flood. I have a book I'm hoping to write someday called The Story of Noah. The First chapter or first book will be talking about the 120 years that it took for Noah to build the ark. Second chapter or book will be, and the first one will be called Noah the Carpenter. Second book will be called Noah the Captain, for he captains and takes care of the huge ark for 371 days. And then the third book will be called Noah the Teacher. And he, after the flood, builds a college called the College of Pre-Flood Knowledge. I believe that 
some of this advanced math and information was given to Adam and Eve in the garden in the first 40 days before they sinned and had to leave the garden. That's a whole other story also. Anyway, stay tuned for that. Maybe I'll be able to talk about that someday when I get my next book written. Thank you all for coming. I should finish that thought. So there's the traditional ones that say it all radiated out from one place. And there are other archeologists who feel that certain civilizations discovered these things on their own without reference back to uh, Europe and the ancient people there. Now we're all done. Thank you so much for joining us. My information is there at the beginning if you wanna to write to me or have interest in any of the books I've written. Yeah, thank you very much, Russ. I think uh, you have established a need for a sequel or maybe several sequels with all these questions that you brought up. Um, uh, certainly, if archaeology uh, looked at things with an open mind, they'd see that very advanced civilizations seem to pop up all over the world uh, around the same time in Southeast Asia, uh, in the New World, uh, that certainly fits with, um, with ancient man carrying all of that pre-flood knowledge, which was uh, then uh, sent out to all the parts of the world that were uh, settled by those fleeing from the confusion of tongues of, of Babel. And of course, the Chinese language was, was formed um, using pic pictographs. Um, Richard Broadberry has spoken to TCS, TCCSA about that. And it's interesting uh, that they use pictographs and not, um, not uh, sounds al alphabetical. Uh, perhaps it was because they thought if the sounds get confused again, uh, we, we will have the pictures. And of course the Egyptians also used use, use pictographs. Um, it's also interesting that uh, the scriptural record talks about the ships of Solomon. They're going, they go off for three years and, and come back. Obviously they're doing some serious navigation. Um, I had another question about the uh, metal artifacts that have been found um, in North America. Now, is it true that Native Americans did not have metal work? Almost 100% true. There are a few places where um, iron oxide, I think is what it's called. It, I, I did a study on this, but I'd have to find my notes that in some swamps, this will somehow come to the surface. But 99% uh, of the iron was brought into the United States from Europe. Uh, as you know, on the iron uh, uh, mountains or uh, in North, uh, Northern Minnesota, you know, the iron deposits in most cases are down, you know, several hundred feet or at least buried by 30 or 40 feet, and then they were, was removed and then the iron ore was brought out. So most all iron ore in the United States is down very deep. However, in Lake Superior on Isle Royal, there are copper mines there that the Indians mined copper from, and that copper actually through trade routes and that was spread all over the United States. And the, it, appears that the Phoenicians who came as far as Niagara Falls traded with the Indian people for copper ingots that were brought back to Europe. And there's a book, and I don't have it at the top of my head, that shows this and shows that that copper came from North America, not from Africa or uh, Europe. So Again, it shows the Phoenicians coming here at 2000 BC. That's this book uh, here uh, by Barry Fell. And there's other artifacts and things found that are very Phoenician looking. 
And so that's a whole another great program. I've also done a program on my ancient relatives, the Native Americans, leaving from Lake Baikal in Russia. They have a written record called the Wallam Wallam, or the Red Record, that tells of their travel from Lake Baikal all the way to finally settle in Delaware there. And they are the um, relatives, ancient relatives of Pocahontas and her people. And that's a whole nother great story to share too. Well, thank you very much for us. And uh, we're gonna wrap it up here. Great, thanks for having me. And uh, hopefully next year, Minnesota <laughs> will come in person. <laughs>